look, we make a lot of videos at Microsoft, but the ones that are the coolest are the ones where we see actual people doing actual things with actual problems. With I'm going to say actual for the whole time. With actual solutions using actual power platform stuff. Speaking of actual people doing actual work, I'm sure many of you know our next presenter, Simona Coton. She is an extraordinary person in the world of serverless and Azure Functions. She's actually a global celebrity in this space. She leads 25 Days of Serverless, which was this global movement last year. And uh, I would say she is probably the foremost expert in the world on the entire concept of serverless and Azure Functions. And the cool thing about her is mm -hmm. when she talks, it is absolutely, I, I went to her talk the first time, it was a couple years ago in London, and uh -huh. I was like, wow, mm -hmm. I just learned a ton. It's mm -hmm. amazing. She's an awesome, awesome, I'm so lucky to be a colleague with her. Exactly. So today she's going to show us something that I personally have never seen, which is how to build powerful serverless apps. Over to you, Simona. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for the wonderful words, both uh, Donna and Seth. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. And I hope you're having a wonderful day, an excellent conference. And for the next 25 minutes, we're actually going to spend time building powerful serverless applications. And by the end of the talk, we have an API with a sense of humor. But before we dive into live coding, we're going to spend a bit of time having a quick overview of serverless so that we're all on the same page. And I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And this is where we're going to look at serverless. And think about time. Time is really important when we're building products. Your market might be time sensitive and you need to grow your products really, really fast. And serverless is really here to help you spend that time on things that are very important um, instead of stuff that might seem shiny, but isn't necessarily essential. Similar to what the Power Platform is helping do as well. And much like high-level programming languages are an abstraction of machine code, serverless is an abstraction for cloud infrastructure. When we're programming in a low-level language, like, for example, assembly, which you can see here on the left-hand side, we need to understand the memory requirements for our code to run, explicitly deallocate and allocate that memory. And it's the same with traditionally deployed applications. We need to estimate workload when we're working with virtual machines, for example, at any given moment in time. And we need to provision that infrastructure required to run our applications. And just like high-level programming languages are abstracting away the burden of configuration and are really enabling us to build applications faster, serverless enables us to focus on the code that is relevant to our product without having to worry about babysitting servers. Nobody wants to babysit servers, right? And in fact, Serverless is really the latest step on the path of taking away the burden of infrastructure. It really gives us the ability to focus on the important things right from the beginning. And in our case, many times it really means that uh, important really means that we focus on solving customer problems first. With serverless, we can be sure that our applications will also scale automatically to meet the current workload. And to level set here, uh, scalability is a term that is used to describe a system's ability to cope with increased load. What happens when our application really grows from maybe 10,000 active users to 100,000 active users? How about from 1 million to 100 million? Our system will generally have to deal with an increased number of concurrent requests, and generally it will also have to process larger volumes of data. And auto scaling is a way to scale up and down the number of computing resources depending upon the actual load that we're currently experiencing. And generally, the goal is to maintain reliable performance even when our load parameters have changed. And with serverless, the platform will dynamically add and remove resources based on the number of incoming events. So 
what that means is that somebody else is taking care of all of this. And generally, scalability is a hard problem to solve. But by outsourcing the job of monitoring and spinning up new instances, we actually get to focus on understanding how components in our system communicate and optimize for that particular bit. Finally, probably one of the most important aspects of serverless is the fact that you only pay for the resources that you are currently using. Imagine how, how much creativity is that uh, unlocking for all of us. Let's say, for example, in a month you have a million invocations using up to 128 megabytes of memory and running for less than a second. That's going to cost you zero dollars. You've heard that correctly, zero dollars. I'm gonna say it again. Nowadays, you can have someone do all the hard work of buying hardware for us, configuring and setting up web servers, patching, um, making like security patches, uh, put a load balancer in front of those servers, run a million times our code, and we pay absolutely nothing for it. I think this is an amazing time to be building applications and kind of be creative with whatever we're creating. Uh, we have the resources to do that. Now, let's increase the number of requests from 1 million to 5 million and use the same amount of memory and CPU. All of this will now cost you less than $5, which is literally probably less than the cost of a Starbucks coffee or maybe an Italian espresso if you prefer that one. Now, I hope that you're all excited about all the great things that you can build with serverless and what, what kind of features are available um, within the platform. And you're already in that stage where you're wondering, well, does that mean that I can use serverless for everything or um, is it better? Does it work better for some other types of applications? And one of the most common use cases for serverless applications is building backend APIs. Um, because of serverless ability to basically give us a URL and listen to requests made at an HTTP um, URL, then that means that we can use serverless functions to uh, build web APIs and backend APIs. Early in my career, I did a lot of data processing. I created lots of batch jobs and a lot of um, reports. And generally what I had to do was um, listen to or at a given uh, time of the day, we would have to process all the CSV files that are at a particular location, um, parse and clean that data in a batch job, and then store that data in a database. And that's the type of work that you can easily do with serverless um, because it's embarrassingly uh, parallelizable and um, it can be executed. Um, it can be executed in parallel. Um, it's also useful to use serverless with third-party uh, integration as a thin wrapper on top of your API calls uh, or whenever you're building chatbots. Um, that's that's a good use case for serverless as well. Um, the Cloud Native Foundation um, white paper that's published on GitHub have identified in practice a series of really good types of workloads that are a good fit for serverless. So in practice, you can um, choose serverless when you have asynchronous and concurrent tasks to be executed, um, maybe infrequent, um, requests and spiky traffic where you don't necessarily have a dependency on latency, as well as whenever you're looking to quickly iterate your development and build MVPs and being able to change your code and um, at the same time having the ability to um, change business requirements and immediately have that code deployed, serverless is a good option for that as well. So how do we, how do we get started? Well, at the core of serverless computing are cloud functions, and they enable us to run code in ephemeral containers and in reaction to an event. And the execution can be triggered by any of the managed services or maybe some custom sources that you might be defining um, and are important for your applications. Because our code is running in ephemeral containers and for the cloud provider to be able to scale out our code infinitely, we will have to write stateless code. This means that we cannot rely on any state being preserved between function calls. So if you do end up having to save state, 
you're going to have to use maybe a data store like a message queue or even a persistent database to store that data that can then be used by the next during the next function call. Um, our code is also event driven um, and it runs in response to specific triggers, which can be maybe of type HTTP when we react to HTTP requests or a blob trigger when we run code in response to a file being uploaded to a storage account. Remember the CSV parsing CSV files? This is perfect. <laughs> um, the anatomy, that is not the correct pronunciation, of a serverless processing model is very well depicted in this diagram. So on the left hand side, we have event sources or, or triggers. They cause our functions to run. Uh, in the middle, you can see the serverless controller, which is responsible for deploying and controlling and like, monitoring our function instances. Um, and then our function instances, which are the yellow gears there, they're um, functions or microservices that can be scaled with demand. So to meet the actual workload. And finally, at the bottom, we have the managed services. These are our data stores, um, maybe authentication providers or events platforms that we can use with serverless applications. And one thing to, to keep in mind is that the scale controller is responsible for scaling up and down our um, functions. And they use a heuristic for, for deciding that. Um, for example, when we are um, using a queue trigger, then um, the heuristic is like we're listening for, um, we're looking at the size of the queue and the age of the oldest uh, message in the queue. And then based on, um, on that particular calculation, we're going to decide whether we need more instances to be deployed to run our code or not. Um, so based on that calculation, it also means that if there's no instances running um, or there's no uh, requests incoming or no messages, then our instances are going to be reduced to zero. Awesome. But we've talked a lot and we've seen no code and that's never fun. So I'm going to switch to my environment and I'm going to show you how to actually get started with serverless functions. And I, I have here an instance of VS Code. Uh, it's an empty one. And the first thing that you need to know as you're getting started with Azure Functions is that you need to create a function app. And in order to do that, you need to have this incredible extension that's called Azure Functions. Um, if you haven't installed it already, please just stop what you're doing. Go ahead and install this uh, extension. It's going to save your life in so many ways. Um, I already have it installed. I'm going to go into the Azure extension here in VS Code, uh, and I'm going to create a new function app. And a function app is basically a collection of our serverless functions, our cloud functions. And I can create this, this function in Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, C Sharp, or Java, depending on what's your preference for um, writing code. Uh, for this one in particular, I'm going to use Python, but I'm a huge fan of JavaScript and TypeScript as well. Uh, we're going to use Python 3 for um, our um, serverless function, and we're going to create an HTTP trigger because remember, we want to create an API. Um, and let's name this generate joke. And in case I haven't mentioned this before, uh, I'm creating this app to create competition for Seth and Donna, who are some of the funniest people I've ever encountered in my life. And when both of them are together, it's even better. Um, so what we are going to do over the next five minutes is create an API that uses AI to generate jokes, and hopefully they will be good enough, uh, and maybe Seth and Donna are going to use some of these as well. Okay, so I, I have created a hello world um, function here, and I can go ahead and test. Um, so before doing anything else, I always like testing my code, making sure that everything works as expected. So you can see here that our function runtime has started, and then this is the URL where I can already start making HTTP requests, and then I'm going to uh, get back a response. So in this case, uh, it says that I need to pass in a name, and let's say we want to say, hi, powerful devs, you are awesome, uh, the absolute best of people. Okay, awesome. So our function works. I'm going to also add um, a breakpoint here, so um, maybe 
if I go refresh this page, we will see that we now have um, our debugger has stopped at line 10 and we can inspect our variables and we can say that uh, we can see that the name is powerful devs um, and once I step through then it's going to come back and show the hello powerful devs message with which is a great confirmation. Okay, but back to our humorous API. Let's go ahead and delete all this code which we don't need. Um, and the first thing that we're going to do is actually retrieve a model that I have already created. Um, using this library called TextGenRNN, um, which uses deep learning to um, take existing an existing data set of one-liner uh, jokes, and then it creates a model, or it already created a model for me, which I'm hosting in blob storage, and based off of that model, I'm going to generate new jokes. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we have retrieved the model. Then the next thing that we want to do is actually generate these jokes. Um, and I mentioned that we, we're doing that using TextGen RNN. Um, so we're first reading the mod, initializing TextGen RNN um, using the model we've just copied from Blob Storage. And then we're going to generate new jokes. Uh, and we're going to return those in a HTTP response. Um, that is a JSON object, contains a JSON uh, object with the, a field joke and the actual joke. Um, so let's go ahead and also say, um, define this HTTP response method, which uh, allows us to format our JSON. And then of course, we also need to import all of these um, dependencies that we are using in our code. And finally, I mentioned that we are using TextGen RNN. Uh, we have to go define that uh, those dependencies in requirements.txt as well. So I'm going to go into my cheat sheet here and copy these particular versions because um, these are the ones that currently work for me. Let me know if you try this and you find uh, a version that works with all the latest versions. All right, so I'm gonna run this uh, application and this will take a bit because now we have to install um, these dependencies. So Keras, TensorFlow, TextGen, RNN. And I wanna tell you the story behind this application. So um, Donna has mentioned 25 days of serverless that happened back in December. I built this application uh, around that time. I published a post on Dev2 on it, explaining the solution. But there was one comment that has haunted me ever since, um, where someone has asked, hey, is this application running live somewhere? Can I test it? Of course, I have published the GitHub repository, but I haven't gone through the process of actually creating a web application that allows you to see these randomly generated jokes. And the reason why I haven't done that, if you're a web developer and you know how many choices we currently have, and you've seen the diagram that Chris on, Co on Code has shared with all of us, you will know that many times we end up dropping projects. So with this new Power Apps platform, um, I thought that, hey, this is my chance to try Power Apps and see how cool it is and how fast um, it empowers me to create applications. So, all right, our function uh, app has started, is available in our local environment. So if I click on the link that has been generated, we should now have the funniest joke ever, I promise. Uh, of course, we're now stopping at the breakpoint we uh, put earlier. I'm going to run through this and then going back into our browser. The funniest joke ever is what do people is the balloon and the fence only talking it is to hand. All right, this is random. This is AI and this is humor that is competing with Donna and Seth right now. We got to do better. <laughs> cool. So we've seen how to create a function app in our local. We've seen how to run and debug it here, but ideally we want to have this application deployed in the cloud so we can use it in our Power App. So I'm gonna stop debugging this and then I'm gonna go back into the Azure extension and this is where we're deploying the application. Um, and the first thing that's gonna ask me is the name of the um, function app or whether I want to deploy over an existing app. 
So let's say we want to name this generate uh, jokes and this is a unique name that needs to be um, created. Um, I want to use Python and deploy it to UK South, which, which is where I'm currently located. Now, I've already deployed this app before, spoiler alert. So instead of waiting for um, our deployment to happen, we're actually going to go and uh, check out this other jokes API that I have deployed earlier. Um, and we can see here that is currently working at the jokesapi.azurewebsites.net. If you want to try this yourself, it's available at aka.ms slash joke. So very simple, check it out, tweet all the jokes that get generated for you. I'm sure they're going to be really good ones. Okay, but we mentioned that we wanted to create, to display this joke in a Power App. So let's go into the Power App dashboard. Um, and in order to connect the Power App to an Azure function, there's, there's many choices, but we're going to go through the simplest one, which is creating a custom connector. And here I'm going to click Create from Blank. Um, I'm going to give it the name API jokes, and now you'll know how, how many dry runs are, I've done, more or less. Uh, so API jokes eight, uh, click continue. Then we're going to upload a picture. I want to make sure that I include a picture that allows me to quickly identify my own custom connector. Um, and then it's going to ask for my host, which is jokesapi.azurewebsite.net and then our base URL is API. The next option that we have available here in our custom connector is um, the authentication type. And remember, we chose anonymous for our function, but of course you can use different types of authentication. So if your function uses a security code or maybe if you need to use OAuth uh, 2.0, you can definitely use that in your custom connectors as well. Let's move on to the definition. We want to add a new action, and this is where we actually call the function method. So let's call this generate uh, joke. And then the operation ID is the same. And our request will be a get method at this particular URL, which I've mentioned many times already. We're importing that um, to define the schema of our request. And then we want to define the schema for our response as well. So instead of defining it manually, I'm actually going to import it from sample. So what I'll do is copy this long joke that has been created here for us um, and then import that and I will generate a very simple um, pattern here. I'm going to create connector. And again, as I mentioned, this is one of the simplest ways of creating custom connectors. Um, my colleague Justin will actually have a talk later on that will give you more um, advanced use cases and I highly recommend you, you come back for that for his talk. And there's a few other folks that are talking about serverless and custom connectors and more advanced use cases. So please stay tuned and check out those talks as well. Uh, okay, now I'm going to go into test and this is where I'm going to have to create a connection to our function um, app, which is just as simple as click and create. And our connection is now available. So yay, we are ready to create a new app. We're going to create a new Canvas app from blank. Um, let's call it uh, Death AI, right? That's Donna and Seth, Death AI. Does that work? I hope so. <laughs> Okay, so creating a new Power App, and this is going to be the simplest Power App that you will have ever seen. Uh, it's literally just a screen with a button and a text. Uh, when you, we click the button, we'll call the function app, um, and when the response comes back, we're going to show that response into the text right here. So let's go ahead and insert a button. And of course, you can create more complicated UIs with the Power App, um, as complicated as you want them to be. But in this case, let's let's keep it simple. Uh, let's rename this as Get Joke, um, and then also add our label. We want to make this bigger in case our joke is a large one. Uh, so in the 
this get joke on select, we want to use the clear collect method, which brings us the data from the uh, from the API, and we want to save that data into a response collection, and then we want to call the function API. Uh, but hey, we haven't actually connected our Power App to our custom connector. So let's go into the Power Apps data option here. And in our connectors, you can see that we will find here API, one second. So we have API jokes eight. We wanna add that connection. We wanna click connect. And immediately our function will become available here. So if I click, if I write, start typing API jokes, it will already autocomplete to generate joke. And then bam, this is um, our API call. And then when we go back to our label, instead of displaying uh, hard-coded text, we want to display our response. And actually we want to get the, the first element of our response. One second, just here. And then we want to retrieve the joke property or display the joke property. Okay, cool. So if everything's connected correctly, um, our application should run and it would, re it would retrieve the next joke. So the way I'm gonna test this, you can either play, cl click preview the app here. So that's what I'm gonna do. And then click get joke. And this is loading, it's loading, and now we're getting ready for the best AI generated joke ever in a bit. Well, that is not working out correctly. Um, so death AI is punished right now. What do you call a pretty cow on a book for the first name? I don't know my shoes. That is so, 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 so random. But hey, it works. <laughs> the other thing that uh, it will be your homework for uh, next time that we meet is actually going into Power Automate and uh, create a flow that will use the exact same API. And it will, instead of displaying it in a Power App, what we want to do is actually send that as a message using the Twilio API. So you can see here that I've already created this stateful orchestration that runs every minute or every week or every day, depending how, on how often you want this to be displayed. Um, and then it makes an HTTP call, it parses that JSON, and it sends the text message to a phone number that you've just chosen. So this is your homework. You have to send me a message with um, AI generated jokes. Cool, that was a lot. If you're feeling overwhelmed, that's because it was definitely a lot to see. Um, and all of this was possible in such a short amount of time because serverless and the Power Platform are really amazing. They enable us to really solve problems creatively and add a fraction of the cost and time that we usually pay and spend when we're using traditionally platforms. And with serverless, we can quickly build and iterate uh, minimum viable products, so MVPs, um, and deploy them to the cloud. And the Power Platform, it enables us to easily automate processes and create like really beautiful interfaces with low code while still taking advantage of the power of the cloud. And really, I have nothing but gratitude and hopeful feelings about how your companies and your products are going to change the world. Based on my experience using serverless and using the Power Platform, I know that these technologies are um, going to serve you well in achieving your goals and changing the world, making the world a better place. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'll be available in Dev2 for Ask Me Anything questions. And please tweet at me at Simone underscore Cotin any of the randomly generated jokes. Beautiful AI. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay, so so many questions right now. Death AI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Death AI behaves as predicted. 
This randomly. Is randomly. Right. So this is Seth's fault. Yes, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what yep. we've decided. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little concerned because, mm -hmm. like, I, I had the market cornered on dad jokes at yeah. Microsoft. That's not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, one yeah. among maybe thousands. Oh. Top, top thousand, at least. I would say top five. Top five. On okay, the dad thank joke you. Situation. That's very nice. Okay. My mom said top three. So. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, might, Seth's mom. Yeah, it might be. Uh, but now an AI, death AI generator mm -hmm. might put me out of, although they were not very good, <laughs> some of them. Because your normal jokes are... My normal jokes are bad, but on mm -hmm. purpose. Like they are, they oh. are, like, you know, like humor is like a loop. Like, like good here. And then like you go all the way and then it's like, this is not so good. And then it's like, this is really bad. This is awful, terrible. And then all of a sudden... Like the terribleness reaches such a juncture, I, I feel like I need to explain this, and, and that now it's like, this is so bad, it's good. 